Hello, I'm David Hunt and welcome to The Art Hunter. The word curator, what does it mean? It's from the Latin word to take care. Manager or oversee an exhibition, working alongside the galleries, museum and of course the artists. My guest today has been honoured with an OAM. Oh, do I remember to curtsy when I met her? I hope she'll still talk to me. I've, I've definitely got to talk about her shoes, but that's another story. Uh, she is a professor at the Victorian College of Arts, a curator, a writer specialising in Australia international programs uh, for contemporary art, visual culture, including exhibitions, publications, workshops, lectures, uh, cultural partnerships across contemporary art and indigenous cultures. We'll be talking about the Tokyo Olympics, but the arts of it, and New Zealand and the Venice Biennale. And I know we'll be talking about uh, Pussy Riot. Natalie King, welcome to The Art Hunter. Thank you, David, for having me on your wonderful program. My pleasure. Now, where did it all start for, uh, for you? You know, like, where did the interest in the arts come from? And, and obviously, you know, like, you've really developed a, a very, very extraordinary career in the arts. I guess um, I can probably trace my interest to the arts to both of my grandmothers. Oh, OK. My paternal grandmother was a ballerina. Aye. And from the age of 12, she took me to matinees at the Forum Theatre. And I remember the incredible wonder and transformation mm. being under the painted Trump loyal ceiling and going to matinees with her. My other grandmother um, was a Polish Jewish woman who migrated to Australia at the age of 12, fleeing um, pogroms. Yep. But she was a part-time painter. So in her um, one, she had a room in her house where there was an easel and the smell of oil paint. So I think both of my grandmothers inspired me and um, perhaps have paved the way for where I am today. Right, okay. So at school, um, you know, like, were the, the arts playing a role apart from family? Um, did it play any role in your life at well, all? Not really. I went to... Um, I went to a school where arts weren't necessarily prioritised, um, but in my home, my father always played a lot of music. Yep. You know, he, I remember Neil Diamond, Yay. and he played like <laughs> very loud Barry White. So there was always a sense of exuberance and music. My parents are youthful, they travelled a lot, so I guess somehow by osmosis there was some cultural aspects, yep. but not necessarily from school. I went to a very academic school, and I had no idea what I wanted to do after school. So I actually started studying law at Monash because my father was a lawyer. But uh, very quickly realized in second year that I needed to exit. So I went and lived in Florence for some time and studied Italian. Whoa. And that's where I fell in love with museums. And I immediately came back and changed to doing an arts degree. So I, I've got to talk about Florence, uh, one of my favourite cities in the world. It's just spectacular. And the countryside, Tuscany, of, of course. That city, to what, you know, like just the architecture alone, let alone all the museums, uh, is, you know, it must have been wonderful living there. So it was really transformative. I was 19. Whoa. It was my first trip on my own with, you know, that rite of passage backpacking trip. So I was studying Italian every morning and then going and looking at Brunelleschi's Duomo or going into museums. And I knew I was, I think I'm really lucky that I realised at that yeah. time that it was like a calling. I needed to be working with artists in the arts. And when I returned, I shifted my focus. What did your father say? <laughs> he didn't mind at all, oh, actually. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, okay. No, my family have always been very supportive. Okay. And yeah, but you know, like not disappointing his daughter, no, you know, because she was studying law. No, no, not at all. Okay, fantastic. So, what what did you study? You know, like was it, um, you know, like a degree in visual arts, or yeah, was it so the I, history? So I did art history and yep. curatorial studies. Um, I volunteered at Monash uh, Museum, 
um, you know, we all have to start somewhere. Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was always interested in photography. Uh, okay. And so from the early 90s, I was starting to curate um, artists who were my peers. So very early on, I did an exhibition at ACA, like in 1994, with a Destiny Deacon was in and I started to form relationships with artists which has really been one of the key threads through my practice. So I, I often work with artists over a long period of time and develop um, quite profound relationships and I guess going back to your definition of curator, so it comes from the Latin word curare which is a verb so it's very mm. active mm. being a curator. So I see part of my role is to take care of artists but also bring their ideas to life. Mm. I like the idea that you actually said you follow through with them. You're, you're not just doing a one exhibition with them or you know, like being introduced to them through a gallery that you might be, um, a gallery or museum. Uh, because that, I, I think that would be really important for an artist, wouldn't it, to have that support? Because it can be a very lonely life um, creative, yes, but lonely and also financially very tough life. Mm. So it's always been important uh, to me to have enduring relationships with artists so, um, and my peers. And I think that um, it gives us a sense of continuity and also it's, it is really important uh, for artists, for someone to understand their practice, understand their thinking, what yep. is motivating them. Yep and to be by their side over a long period of time. Yeah. Has there been a time though where you thought, oh, okay, I'm gonna work with um, an artist and, and, and follow through with them and all of a sudden uh, you've gone, no, I can't do this. You know, like, I've got to step away. Um, you know, like you'd started to disagree with them or they weren't mm. listening. That's a touchy question. Uh, well, uh, you don't have to name uh, names. <laughs> you know, there are instances where there's a lot of pressure on artists. Yep and some projects, especially international ones, are incredibly unremitting and artists can get quite feverish. But I usually think there is a way to work through challenges. And I guess I've learned over time that I try and from the outset say to an artist, if we're working on something that it has um, magnitude, the most important thing to me is our relationship. We must at all times remain civil and courteous yep. if yep. something is bothering you and it will yep we need we can just there's nothing we can't mm. work through together mm. so I've, I've tried to have that approach but most of the time it's worked yeah occasionally things go awry but it's often to do with other circumstances so mm. you're a lecturer what what do you lecture well, actually, I'm not a formal lecturer. So I have this incredible role at the Victorian College of the Arts. I'm called an enterprise professor, whereby I bring partnerships uh, to the university. So I've developed partnerships with the Biennale of Sydney, the Asia Pacific Triennial, uh, the Kochi Missouris Biennale in India, and facilitate opportunities. So occasionally I might give a masterclass or um, host a visitor, but I don't do any formal lecturing. So I'm headquartered at the VCA, uh -huh. primarily working as a curator, editor, and working on publications projects. So it's actually nirvana for me yeah. because I'm, um, you know, museums are very bureaucratic and they have a lot of regulations, whereas mm. an art school is an, a really informal place and there's, it's very youthful, there's new ideas, burgeoning and it's um, yeah I'm very happy being at the VCA. Do you have much contact though with students you know like do you get involved with them or are you a step away from them? Well it really depends so for example uh, with the Biennale of Sydney what we would do is uh, after the Biennale opens we select some artists and bring them down to do like a micro residency at the VCA. So I would be involved in hosting them, ah. introducing them to students, okay. they might do some crits. So there would be special occasions where I'm more actively involved uh, with students. But sometimes some students reach out to me. Um, you know, I do quite a lot of mentoring, which oh, okay. I never intended to do, but <laughs> it's something I felt that I didn't have many mentors myself. Mm -hmm. Um, in the arts and it can be, um, you know, it's a quite competitive field and sometimes it's challenging to navigate. So I've made a real commitment to mentoring um, emerging leaders in the field. And um, actually I won an award this year, the University of Melbourne's 
Excellence Award for mentoring. So, oh, lovely. Um, yeah, I really feel that there are ways of working that maybe I can share with others or yep. troubleshooting or, yep. Yep. you know, we're all in this together yep. and we all have similar yep. kind of challenges. So networking must be an extremely important part of your, uh, your career and your life. I guess it's relationships that I turn to um, rather than the role. So I have relationships that have been over a very long period of time um, and that it's been, especially during lockdowns, it's been very important to maintain those relationships during such a long extended period of seclusion. Yeah. Um, but in some ways it's been a, an incredible equaliser. So it's been possible to commune with colleagues in Tokyo or in Scandinavian countries via Zoom. So um, I'm kind of as busier than ever. Yeah. Uh, now, you've done some interviews along the way, um, Ai Weiwei, which um, he was here in uh, Melbourne, had an exhibition at the NGV. How long ago was that? COVID miners um, uh, crept in. Uh, was it three or four years ago or was it longer than I, that? I actually interviewed him when he showed at Campbelltown, so it was prior to prior, that. Uh, right, mm. before, before he came to the NGV. Uh, what an extraordinary man. You know, like, and the fact is that his Chinese and you know like and, and being to jail there for you know like mm. pushing the boundaries a little bit and and that but so famous around the world isn't he? Well he certainly has cult status it's mm. probably to the way he tweets and his social media following. Well that's what got him into trouble exactly. wasn't it? Exactly. Yeah. But I've always interviewed artists yep. it's probably like this the, okay. whole extra, the whole idea of an exchange a conversation a dialogue with an artist is really important to me to, to listen and to understand how an artist might be thinking. So I interviewed Ai Weiwei around the time that he um, worked on the Beijing Olympics. And I remember the interview very well because I asked him, what has he got planned for the future? And he said, I have no future. And he was very soon after detained. So it was almost prophetic, but Wow. He, he was very, very meticulous about the interview. He needed to check all the copy, all the captions. Whoa. He had a very big team working around him. Um, and this was on the occasion when he showed at Campbelltown in New South Wales. So I went up and there was a really lovely dinner in the gallery with him. And um, he was quiet and softly spoken, but I also met him at the NGV. Yeah, so did I. Yeah. I, I was lucky enough to meet yeah. him there as well. Um, well, we'll stick with the Olympics because, um, you know, like this year there's been an Olympics on in Tokyo, as we all know, uh, and there's always a cultural side of it. And Ai Weiwei, that's what he, he wouldn't have been running the 100 metres. He would have been on the cultural side of it uh, in uh, Beijing. Uh, what was your involvement there? So I've curated an exhibition called Reversible Destiny that's at the Tokyo Photographic Art Museum. And it's an exhibition of eight artists from Australia and Japan, and it's co-curated with the museum. So the Tokyo Photographic Art Museum, it's called TOP in Japan, is the premier photography museum in Japan. Mm -hmm. It has a collection of around 35,000 works. Whoa. And it's a very large museum across three floors with an education center, a cafe, a bookstore. So it's certainly an honour to work with them. Mm. I've actually worked with them previously oh, okay. in 2004 and in 2006. Yep. Um, I toured Destiny Deacon's solo exhibition to top. And I, um, I didn't hear from them for some time. Yeah. But then they saw um, Tracy Moffat's exhibition at the Venice Biennale that I curated in 2017. And the museum reconnected with me via the embassy and said, would you like to work with us again? I said, absolutely. And what they suggested was a another national Australian exhibition. I said, you know what? Let's progress the curation and let's work together. Mm. Let's see what we might have in common. Let's think about um, something jointly because I do really enjoy collaboration. So we started formulating some ideas that were relevant and that would resonate to both of our communities. And we came up with this idea of reversible destiny. So the idea is about how can we think about the past to imagine collective futures? So okay. the whole idea about time, which is very relevant for photography, the idea of yesterday, today, tomorrow, 
which actually is so relevant now, even though this concept was devised um, really in 2018. So the exhibition was meant to be held last year. Of course. And you know, I spent a lot of last year um, dealing with an evaporating calendar, you know, potential cancellations, redoing funding, um, funding timelines. It was, you know, it was certainly really challenging, but the museum and I, we worked through some scenarios whereby the exhibition would be postponed, which was my um, optimum outcome because the artists had made all the work. Yeah, so yeah, of course. we really had to, the show mm. had to go on. Mm. So uh, what the museum did is in March, when our borders opened, they freighted the works over there and we arranged for most of the Australian artists' works to be acquired by the museum. So there's a, now this wonderful legacy at the museum. So I thought even if in the end there's another lockdown and it doesn't go ahead, the works is, and the, there. Will, be, will reside yep. um, in this very expansive yep. collection. Um, but, you know, it's certainly been something I hadn't anticipated. I never expected to be installing an exhibition via Zoom. Uh, in Tokyo, like you know, certainly with a sense of um, some sadness, but also a miracle that in this particular climate, uh, the exhibition has gone ahead. It's had relatively good attendance. We produced a bilingual catalogue with an, um, a fictional essay by the Aboriginal author Tony Birch, and we did an online uh, symposium with Tokyo University of the Arts. University of Melbourne and the museum. So all the artists had an opportunity to talk about their work. Mm. Over my shoulder is, um, there's some red and black cards yeah. this guy's holding up and, and he's in, is it a volcano or is it a salt a lake or what's going on in that, that piece? So this is a series by an artist called Val Wenz who is an Indonesian artist. He was based in Sydney, but he recently uh, moved to Victoria. And he went back to Java and he photographed himself performing in front of a sulfur lake. And it looks very beautiful, but it's also incredibly toxic. Mm. And he uh, holds up different props. And in some of the images, he's juggling. So he learned to juggle uh, in the Hard Rock Cafe in Jakarta. Whoa. And he uses the whole idea of performing in the landscape and juggling to explore his um, gay identity as a Muslim man oh, and the challenges okay. of um, his community. Right. Mm. How, how did you find somebody like that? Is, or is it just, oh, I've known them for years. Is it as simple as that? I have been looking at his work for some time and I was, sometimes with artists, I'm waiting for the occasion to percolate and for me to find the right occasion so I was happy to include him in this in this exhibition and there's also another work where he's performing in a forest and he's juggling and it's sort of I guess about his his own precarity and juggling his own multiple identities right mm. now over over your shoulder is um, a couple of hands or are they what's going on there it's yeah, you know, like it's very unusual, and and I'm seeing is it a deformed hand? So this is a relatively new series by a Japanese artist called Mari Katayama, and I first saw her work at the Venice Biennale in in 2019. Yeah, and in the big curated show, and I was completely transfixed, and I thought, oh, I've got to find a way to work with her. So she was born with a very rare condition whereby her limbs did not grow. Oh. And she chose at the age of nine to have her lower limbs fully amputated. What she chose to? She chose, Whoa. so she has prosthetics. Yeah. So she's an incredibly courageous artist and she turns the lens back on her body and she celebrates her body in all its um, disabled, this. Well, and there's a little bit of glitter. So and, she's put and glitter on it. Yeah. yeah. And um, these works are presented as very large suspended light boxes. Wow. So they have this sort of aquatic blue around them. And she said that um, it, it was partly inspired by being in Venice, showing in this exhibition that I saw. 
and she was trapped in her hotel room because of Aqua Alta, which is the the floods in Venice, oh, and she okay. couldn't move because right. she's not mobile. Yep. And the feeling of sort of terror, but also um, kind of abandoning herself to this situation. So she, that's what she was partly thinking about. Right. Okay. And then below, on uh, over your shoulder again, is this extraordinary um, a piece, and I'm so glad that I can sit looking at it, in a forest, uh, this amazing dress, but it's got a rabbit head. What's going on? And that's what I love about photography, because you can push the limits so much with photography. Yeah, so this work is by Polixeni Papapetrou, who many people might have seen her big survey exhibition at the NGV, and the work is called The Lona. And she often photographs uh, her children, particularly her daughter Olympia, in masks, in vintage That's right. costumes. Yep, yep. Um, so this work partly references Peter Rabbit, mm. but it's also really mysterious. <laughs> so it's you don't know who's wearing the costume, yep. what the pose is. They're often very theatrical. Um, Polly was a very close friend of mine um, until her her passing. She died of a terminal illness. Uh, about three years ago oh, okay. and so we worked together over a very long period of time. We travelled to Korea, we worked on many exhibitions including the Tarawara Biennial so in some ways I wanted to honour her and oh, lovely. Lovely. Um, pay, tribute, pay tribute to her so the other works that we have in the exhibition um, are the final works that she made uh, and they're called My Heart Still Full of Her and they're very much about her um, very intimate connection with her daughter mm -hmm. and what she did at the end of her life is she was a very organized person and she trained as a law initially trained as a lawyer so she methodically went through all her negatives from 30 years ago and she retrieved negatives from the 80s and then superimposed images of her daughter on top of them ah. so it's very much about the cycle of life, okay. the beginning and end, life and death. Right. And where, where can we see see them, Natalie? Are they anywhere that, you know, like on, on a website or...? Um, well, if you go to the top website, they all they're appear there. there. Yeah. there. Okay. Mm. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, because it fascinates me because I do remember seeing her at the NGV as well, um, her, her amazing photography. Photography. What what is it about photography that really um, excites you? Because I love photography as an art form. A lot of people go, "Oh, it's not true art," but it, mm. I think people's um, you know, like they've changed their their thoughts on that in the last say fifteen years, haven't they? Because mm. a truly is a great art form now. Photography. I completely agree with you. I've always been drawn to photography. I think it has this incredible legibility and immediacy, and also this mysterious quality so to do with time so it's capturing a moment in time but might be looking backwards to look forwards yep. which are the very concepts that we were exploring in yep. reversible destiny right. all right you've mentioned uh, biennales a couple of times name dropping being there you oh the floods were there and you're like we were stuck in our rooms and all that and you're like how many times have you been to a, the biennale actually the venice biennale you know i think well i curated tracy moffat yep and I went on the site visit with uh, the artist Yuki Kihara, who I'm curating next year, probably only three times. Oh, so okay. actually, I, I don't go regularly. Right, okay. Um, no, but I'm lucky to have gone more recently. Now, you're mentoring, or is that the right word, um, of a New Zealand, um, you know, who's representing New Zealand at the Venice Biennale. Uh, tell us about that. What's going on there? So I'm actually the curator of uh, the New Zealand Pavilion for right. the Venice Biennale next year, which has also been delayed one year. Right. And I put in a joint submission with an artist called Yuki Kihara. Oh, so, okay, you, you suggested her to... Well, the story is every country... Uh, procures their artist and curatorial teams differently. Right. So New Zealand did an open call and I reached out to Yuki Kihara on social media. We had never worked together before uh -huh. and I had to convince her. She knocked me back a couple of times. Why? She had been disappointed previous on previous applications where the curator had not quite ah, submitted or okay. things went awry. Yeah. So I was aware that she had shown at the Met in 2008 I'd seen her work in Brisbane at the Asia Pacific Triennial 
and uh, I just knew that I wanted to work with her. So we set up some Zoom meetings. So she's based between Samoa and New Zealand and she's the first transgender, indigenous and Pacific artist to be selected ever by New Zealand. And she's part of a community called the Fafafine, which means uh, in Samoan, in the manner of a woman. Okay. And uh, I went to visit her last March in Samoa and we made studio visits and I met many of her friends and colleagues and members of her community. And we're really excited because about a week ago we released uh, the title of the exhibition. It's called Paradise Camp. <laughs> so there's a lot of um, campness to it. But on a more serious note, uh, she looks at issues of indigeneity, um, gender, intersectionality, mm. climate crisis. Um, Very topical, right yes. there. You know, like everything you've mentioned yes. is so now, isn't it? So I feel like she's looking at some of the most urgent issues of mm. our times, but in a camp, poetic, humorous, but also scholarly way. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Samoa, you know, like a, a, a little country, you know, like connected with New Zealand here. Um, you know, like that somebody this special has come out of a place like that. And the fact that you're here in Melbourne, you're like connecting with her. It's, it's amazing how the world, the art world, it sometimes can be very small considering how, how big it is as well. Yeah, that's actually, I hadn't thought of that. It's a really interesting observation. I guess there are all these interconnections. So, you know, I'd seen her work on a number of occasions and found a, a way to reach out and um, she'd shown in Sydney previously. Um, so she's uh, made a, a series recently um, about confinement where she wears a mourning costume. Um, so she's often working on really interesting locations, almost like a film director, a cinematographer, uh, very highly staged images that are sumptuous and um, quite dazzling. Right. Okay. Uh, I've got to. I've got to mention it. it the uh, the elephant's in the room somewhere. It's in the room. I can see see him sitting over there. Um, Pussy right. Yeah. You know, like you. We spoke about Ai Weiwei, but you've you also interviewed them. Explain to people that might not know who Pussy Riot are and the importance of them. So Pussy Riot, they are a collective based in Russia and they did this incredibly irreverent stunt in a church whereby, against Putin, where they put on masks and they sort of upskirted and danced around in a church. And they're and they all, were, all females. All female. Yep. And they wear these knitted balaclavas yep. and it went viral and they were detained for quite a long period of time. Well, they're, they're in jail. And incarcerated. Yeah. So I've always been obsessed by their really brave activism against authority. And Pussy Riot came to perform in Melbourne at the Art Centre. And I arranged um, subsequently to interview one of the members called Maria Alyokina. And so I interviewed her, it was about 3 a.m. in Moscow mm -hmm. uh, via you know WhatsApp or something. And so she was very, very upfront Critic, criticizing the government and we kept hearing noises and I wondered if she if we were being listened in on right by the government I'm sure they probably were because the next day she was detained oh mm. so they they're just not giving up they're really following there now that's what I wanted to, to mention here about the fact that what they they're doing you know like they're putting their lives at risk and and going to jail for their art mm. That is taking art to another level, isn't it? You know, where you're very political with your art. Uh, and history has shown it, but it's so wonderful that there are, are people, and like Ai Weiwei as well, who ended up, you know, because he was being a little bit too vocal on social media. Um, what, what's your opinions on, on um, uh, you know, like art and politics? I think... Um artists should have a voice mm. and find ways to use it. And if that means speaking up against authority or against repressive systems, or then that's really important. Mm. And speaking up against regimes and look at the repercussions too. Yep, yep. Uh, and do you find it a little bit hard at times, say Pussy Riot for instance, you're like, 
uh, if if a, an opportunity came along that you you could be more involved with them, but would you hesitate because you think to yourself, I don't want them to get into put themselves into a dangerous place. Well, I wouldn't want anyone to be in a dangerous situation. I think. But they they create it for themselves, yes, don't they? Yes, yes. But that's how they that's how they've found a voice, and I guess some notoriety. But they've paid a very high price. Yeah. So I read Maria Aliokina's um, biography, autobiography, and honestly, she describes in really vivid detail being in remote parts of Russia, um, incarcerated, and you know, being freezing and not having enough food, and the humiliation. And, yeah. Yep. Um, you know, it's it's an incredible book, um, but uh, also a document documenting yeah. what happen has happened to people. Uh, I'm I'm surprised that the uh, was allowed to be released. Mm. Um, that that shocks me. So so in one way they you know the Russians are making very very bold steps to to block it, but then they're letting it be released in, on the, the other hand. I, I get confused. At I times. guess it's published outside of Russia. Or right. Or it's like Beruz Buchani, you know, who was on Manus Island. Yeah. He texted his memoir. True. I mean, that's incredible, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. So artists, I find, they often can find a way. And even at the moment when our sector's in such a state of acute distress, artists often find a way to be heard. And that's and part of our role to assist artists to flourish. Yeah, mm. yeah. And and for somebody like you to embrace it and then for the general public mm. to be aware of what they're, they've gone through for mm. their art. Um, where do you see yourself in the next, say, five years? And I know somebody in your position, you work, you know, like this, um, uh, the Venice Biennale that you're working on at present, uh, and it's been delayed uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, and that's been for, I, I think I actually um, chatted to you about three or four mm. years ago on radio, and you are already um, starting to um, be involved in this. So, so therefore, you know, like, do you know what you're doing in, say, five years or what you would like to be doing? Or there's a, a shaking you of know, the head? I don't know, but I just have faith that what will come my way will present itself. Yeah. And when one project ends, there's sometimes some, a flurry of panic or uncertainty. But I know that it always happens something will arise. And if it doesn't for some time, that's okay too. So often I... Um, I work on exhibitions that are very outward facing and have huge amounts of labor, but then in maybe an alternate year, I might work on a book, which is a much more reclusive, yep. quieter yep. activity. So I like to sort of do both. Um, and any books in the, in the wings? Well, we've just sent to uh, print actually in Thailand, Yukiki Hara's book. So I'm very excited about that. It's multi-authored and uh, we commissioned over 10 new essays on her practice. Um, so that book I've just finished, which is good. And uh, the publication for Reversible Destiny. And then and, and the, the book, where, where will it be available? You know, like, is it you know, like worldwide or you know, so online? Be, or? So part of applying to uh, curate the New Zealand Pavilion, it was a very complex application. It took us about five weeks to write is that you had to do a global distribution plan for your publication. Yeah. You had to do a full freight consignment and customs clearance into Venice. Venice is a very complicated city yeah. to freight artworks into because mm. there's no trucks. <laughs> <laughs> there's no, where are the forklifts? So um, yeah, we definitely have a significant plan to make sure the book is available because who knows who can travel? Yep. So something like the publication, the documentation, the digital assets are all increasingly more and more important for yep. access. Yep. But where where would I pick it up, or our our viewers? You know, like uh, would well, we... hopefully it'll be in the NGV bookstore, right? Okay. Some of the main bookstores. Right. Yeah. Okay. It's, we've got a very big publisher. Okay. But well, 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 that, well got, that's uh, got significant distribution. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, and the NGV does that an amazing book fair. Yeah. As as well, which is um, you know, like, and and it's unbelievably popular. Mm. Um, or this year was a bit, or last year was a bit hard. Now I've got to talk about your shoes. Um, <laughs> kick your foot up in the air. <laughs> uh, I commented before about the shoes. Uh, there and there's a story behind them. Come on, well, tell me the story. These shoes are very special to me, and they were gifted to me by the artist Polixeni Papapetru, who did the loner, the work with the rabbit. 
and uh, she became increasingly immobile. Uh, before I went to Venice with Tracy Moffat and she loved fashion and style and art and photography and one day she said to me I can't wear these anymore because I can't walk and we're the same size she said you have them so whenever I go to a special occasion like coming here to s talk with you um, I wear these shoes and they're Stella McCartney and Stella they're just McCartney. divine they are but th that's an art piece, isn't it? No. So. Um, they, they could sit on, <laughs> you know, like the, in an exhibition and everyone would go, mm, they're mm. made for art. They're not made for um, somebody to wear. Are they comfortable? They uh, are actually. Are they're they? very comfortable. Yeah. Uh, they're and, not like uh, stilettos. They're super comfortable. Okay. But they're sentimental. So they're from someone who is yeah, very special yeah. to me. And, mm. and somebody whose dad is very um, special as well. Uh, just what, what she's achieved, considering that she could have just gone, ah, I'm, I'm set up for life, you know, like mm. Dad, Dad's going to look after me. Mm. Uh, she's forged a, a real mm. career for herself, hasn't mm. she? Um, and loved by um, people in the, the fashion world. Well, mm. they're, they're spectacular. Natalie, thank you so much for chatting with us today. Um, can't wait to see where your journey takes you, um, uh, but you know where you're going uh, to Venice Biennale. Is it next year or have they taken? So it's next April. April, It opens right. on the 23rd of April. Right, okay. Um, and we're in the middle of planning whether we go, whether we don't go. It's a lot of scenario planning at the moment, but we're hopeful. Yeah, we're I mean, hopeful. The, uh, Italy is open. All the museums are yep. open. Yep. The Architecture Biennale just closed. They're getting a thousand visitors a day. So I think we need to remain hopeful. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I think you'll, you'll get there and, um, and I can't wait to, to find out all about it. Thank you so much Thank for being Thank you so here. much, Dave. It's been a pleasure. So thanks for watching The Art Hunter. I'm David Hunt and we'll see you again real soon. Bye.